transform 3D printing presented by Columbus Idea Foundry is the first of four of a four-part technological or technology ser series called Game Changers. Uh, series topics will include panels on human computer interface, drones, and the robot rev revolution. Today is all about 3D printing. Our panelists represent a broad scope of talents, experience, and entrepreneurial spirit. Please welcome Brooks Myers, founder and CEO of Knockout Concepts. Hello. That's Brooks. <laughs> Michael Cowell, founder of IC3D Printers. Michael. <laughs> Ethan Dix from the Columbus Idea Foundry, the guy in the red shirt. Starting us off today with an overview of the Columbus Idea Foundry and 3D printing is Alexander Bandar, director of the Columbus Idea Fa Foundry. Uh, please join me in welcoming Alex and our panelists. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I assume everyone can hear me in the back. Um, we're hugely grateful to be at the, uh, at the Columbus Metropolitan Club today and uh, grateful to talk about what the Columbus Idea Foundry has been doing for the last five years, where we're going for the next 25 years and beyond, and uh, how we uh, are involved in 3D printing and actually a number of the other things in the Game Changer series. So I'll start off first by talking about uh, why the Columbus Idea Foundry exists. We realize, uh, well, we, the, the DIY tech geeks, people who like to work with computers, people who like to work with our hands, realize that in the last few years, a revolution has occurred where knowledge on how to do things is no longer the bottleneck. You don't necessarily need to go to college. Uh, you can watch a video on how to build almost anything from a table to a mobile app. Um, couple that with free and powerful software that can do things like design the objects that are printed on a 3D printer. Those are now legally downloadable for free. You can learn how to use them for free. And then, of course, the revolution in uh, digital machines that will make things for you. Think 3D printers, think laser cutters, think computer-controlled mills. All of these are becoming cheaper uh, and more powerful and more approachable. You don't have to be a drafts person. You don't have to be an engineer to use them. If you're just an enthusiast, then you can learn on your own. And you can come to a place like the Idea Foundry to find like-minded folks to help you work through interesting problems. So uh, this is called the, the maker movement. Uh, you can call it the new name for the, the tech DIY industry. And that's what we've been doing for five years. We have lots of tools, we teach classes on our tools, and then we sell memberships so people can come in and use them like they're yours. So if you have an art project, an innovation, a small business you want to start, the barrier to entry is really low now, 35 bucks a month. Uh, and you get to play with all the tools and work with super talented folks to help you walk through those tools too. So some of the things that we uh, regularly play with are actually a few of the object, the items that were just mentioned in the future Game Changers series. So drones, we have a number of flying robots we play with. Um, our, the high school robotics team that we sponsor competed in a 2,500 school international competition to demonstrate uh, what their robots can do. Two years ago, they came in second. Last year, they came in first. So there's a, a really huge grassroots uh, base of talent and passion that can take this technology and uh, really make it real. Uh, talk about human computer interface. Uh, we have Google Glass. This is that fancy pair of glasses that's actually a cell phone, a GPS, a computer. You can surf the web with it. And in fact, this was what I was wearing when the Knockout Concepts guys scanned my head a couple weeks ago at the shop. And that's what is being printed if people saw our little demonstration on the IC 3D printers that Michael started in the hallway. This is why it looks like I have one big crazy eyebrow. That's actually the, uh, the Google Glass here. And uh, we'd love to be involved in helping people learn more about this technology. So that's what we've been doing for five years. What we'll be doing for the next 25 is um, moving to East Franklinton. We were hugely grateful to be invited by uh, Mr. Jim Sweeney, Executive Director of the Franklinton Development Association, who saw what we were doing as pro-creative, pro-entrepreneurship, um, pro-small business, pro-education, pro-tech, and that has a powerful role in revitalizing a neighborhood. So uh, he invited us to relocate to a, a beautiful new warehouse in East Franklinton. We had the groundbreaking uh, a week ago, and that was thanks to, well, we'll go back a bit, thanks to um, Mayor Michael Coleman, 
for having the vision to give this building to the Franklinton Development Association with the charge of helping to revitalize the neighborhood. So that's really what sparked this. Then uh, the Columbus Foundation, uh, Mr. Doug Kreidler, pointed us to some grants by organizations uh, such as Art Place America. Uh, we co-applied uh, for a grant there, uh, and actually we're one of 50 that were granted to about 1,200 applicants. So uh, that's a, a national creative placemaking organization that recognized the utility of providing these kinds of tools and the talent and knowledge behind them uh, to really anyone who wants to play with them. So, uh, and uh, the Columbus Foundation also uh, uh, then provided a grant on their own to help this get going. So that is what funded our relocation to the space. Uh, we're building out the first floor to accommodate uh, our existing location, our existing tools, keep doing what we've been doing for five years at the new space. And we're about to embark on a fundraising campaign to raise the funds for the rest of the building, to build out the second floor, the rooftop, the basement, really make it what's actually going to be the largest maker space in the world. So by partnering with COSI, by partnering with 400 West Rich, the arts community in Franklinton, we're really looking to put together a neighborhood center of education, technology, creativity, and enterprise. And couldn't be more grateful for the, the groundswell of support in Columbus, uh, in Ohio uh, more broadly, uh, and uh, folks like uh, uh, Columbus Metropolitan Club for letting us talk about what we're doing. And uh, what we're, uh, we're going to be talking about today is 3D printing. And to give you an example of how Columbus in specific and Ohio in general has what to me was a surprising tech base, uh, we competed in a competition that was international put on by a group called Make Magazine. They're the champion of this kind of DIY tech culture. And they challenged all the cities around the world to see who could bring the most number of people under their roof that do 3D printing, that do electronics and programming, that do robotics. And so uh, we competed. Uh, Ethan Dix has been hosting a, a monthly meetup at our shop for four years uh, of enthusiasts who like to do this kind of work. And uh, other international cities like Paris, like London, like Singapore all competed, uh, as well as some of our peer cities, uh, Seattle, uh, Austin, Portland. If anyone was at the peer city benchmarking event a few months back with Doug Kreidler and Alex Fisher, you know that Columbus excels in certain areas and, and less so against our peer cities. Uh, but actually, to our great surprise and delight, we came in number one, which really shows that Columbus has this passion, this talent uh, to beat out uh, other international cities. And again, more broadly, Ohio is really embracing this. There are programs in Cleveland, programs in Cincinnati that are doing the same kind of work as well. So hugely grateful that, that we have these groups. And uh, I think that's uh, what we've been doing at the Idea Foundry in general. In particular today, we're going to talk about the 3D printing components and again, encourage people to come out and see the machines in action after the luncheon. Uh, I know a few of you saw it before our luncheon, but uh, to kick us off, I'd like to ask for a brief description of what 3D printing is. And I think Ethan can tell us that. And then after that, we'll ask Michael about how these machines actually, uh, what the business is like, how you promote through nonprofits and educational groups. And then lastly, say you have one of these machines, you want to print an object, how do you make that 3D file? That's what Knockout Concepts really helps with, with a handheld computer scanner. You can wrap around a shape and then print it. So that's more than enough for me. Uh, if, if you are interested in learning more about the, our, proje our project and program, uh, please feel free to come up to me or to Mr. Jim Sweeney afterwards and see if you'd like to be involved in the, in the new movement in East Franklinton. But that's enough. I'm going to ask Ethan now to explain uh, about the basics of 3D printing. Sure. Well, 3D printing, as the name mentions, uh, is meant to evoke a comparison with 2D printing, the kind you do with ink on paper. So 3D printing is printing a solid object in three dimensions out of plastic. <coughs> and to do that, um, just like you know, you'll have a laser printer for doing general office printing, a specialty tool that's meant to put ink on paper. A uh, 3D printer is a device that can take the raw plastic and uh, it heats it up and uh, moves a print head around. If you saw the demonstration, you get to watch Alex's head being drawn. And so you've got parts that move back and forth, parts that move up and down, and one line at a time, layer by layer by layer, it builds up your part uh, from, from the drawing you supply with it. The, um, the whole industry only goes back about 30 years to when somebody said, well, hey, we have these CNC tools that can have a human um, feed in instructions to cut away, but what happens if we build up instead? And so just like a, a CNC would take a block of aluminum and chip away the parts you don't want to keep, a 3D printer starts with a blank tablet, blank slate, and then builds up the parts you do want. 
And uh, we have plenty of examples outside too. You're welcome to come by and handle them. And as Ethan <coughs> pointed out, since you're not machining material away, but actually adding material on the interior, you can build structures that are literally impossible to machine otherwise. So you can do something kitschy like uh, my big bald head or these exotic kind of jewelry or sculptural applications. Then you can even take these, make molds from them, and then pour silver, pour brass, pour bronze. So it's opening technology uh, to a whole other class of folks who are creatives, who are artists, uh, small <coughs> business product developers. So um, uh, I'll ask Michael about what some of the challenges are reaching out to the educational groups and nonprofit groups uh, for 3D printing. These used to be very expensive machines, very technologically challenging machines. How does IC3D help that? Thanks, Alex. So IC3D uh, was created uh, to basically provide more affordable and higher quality printers and filament to people. And uh, last year we decided to focus on the education and nonprofit sector. And uh, basically one of the, one of the core, um, uh, I guess, principles of, of IC3D is that the, the whole point is to make this technology more accessible to people, right? And so that's one of the fundamental reasons why we are focusing on this sector. Right? Uh, we want to get more uh, students, more kids uh, using this technology, have access to it, have uh, lower cost, high but high quality material um, to make things. We want to basically uh, kind of reprogram them or we, we want to make them understand that uh, designing and creating something is, is not challenging, right? Anybody can do this, right? So, so, it, um, uh, so it's trying to unlock you know, the potential of, of kids so we can have a better future. But the, you were asking about the challenge. Um, the challenge is, is actually quite easy because it's, it's the, the only key, the only challenge is to make it accessible. And, and that's, that means cost and, and reliability. And so that's what we're focusing on. And I think that's a great point. This technology is maybe 20, 30 years old, but those machines were hundreds of thousands of dollars, even millions of dollars. And now these machines are coming down to um, 10,000, 5,000, 2,500, uh, even sub 1,000 now. So really, schools that wanted to have this kind of uh, technology, now it's within their reach, and it provides access to, to students, to uh, art teachers, to uh, engineering teachers, to provide a hands-on, visceral uh, experience that really wasn't possible even five years ago. And if you surf the web, you can find uh, thousands and thousands of objects that are designed by regular folks, uploaded there, and anyone can download them and print them yourself. So uh, it, it's hugely fun, uh, hugely empowering. And I think that's, that's a word I keep coming back to, which is empowering. Uh, and when these machines first started, you had to be an engineer, you had to be a drafts person, you had to be experienced in computer-aided design, so you could make a computer file that would tell the machine how to print the object. Those softwares were a little bit complicated, and they were good for engineering components, good for architectural components, so flat surfaces, round holes. If you wanted to do something organic or jewelry oriented, it's very, very difficult. Um, but along with the rest of this kind of culture, these technologies are getting easier. Now there's a, a piece of software that looks like a ball of clay on the computer. And where you drag the mouse, it either removes the material or adds material to it. So if you're a 10 year old with a talented eye and some patience, you can download this program for free you can watch a YouTube video for free on how to do it, and then make your shape, and then hit print, and send it to the, one of these machines. So uh, the three ways you can print these kinds of objects are either you design the shape yourself by one of those methods I described, or you download an existing shape from these online repositories. Uh, there's a place called The Warehouse where they have thousands of these parts. Um, but again, that requires a little bit of creativity, a little bit of technical talent, uh, the third way is actually to have uh, a handheld scanner uh, that you can wrap around an object and give you that high resolution digital image that you can then send to your, uh, to your printer or to your laser cutter or to your computer controlled mill. And we'll let Brooks about knockout concepts talk about some of the, uh, the exciting applications that handheld 3D scanners can provide. Thank you, Alex. And it's great to be here. Um, so like he said, if, if you don't have technical skills with CAD software or trained technically in design, um, you, want, you might want to still get into creating something in the 3D space. And that's what the scanner lets you do. You capture 3D files, your friends, parts that you've 
carved out of clay or otherwise made yourself and you want to reproduce them, um, it kind of starts with a scanner. Um, so Knockout Concepts is here as a company in Columbus. We're a startup and we're also down in the Franklinton area and we're very interested about what it takes to make a 3D scanner completely accessible to anyone because it still is a very technical experience, but to bring it down to, to make it accessible and easy for anybody to use so that you can create something, you can take it and send the file to your 3D printer. Um, if you don't wanna send it to your 3D printer, you could post it online for somebody else to use. You can augment it, you can edit it, you can change it in some ways. So the 3D scanner is kind of like the point and shoot to old printers that would print photos. Um, and so this is a starting point and we're very excited to bring this technology down to the users. Um, we have a prototype here that is very simply just a point and shoot system. It's all you need. You don't have to plug it into anything else. Um, you know, it has a touch screen on it and all of the processing happens in here. And so you just literally sweep this around the surface that you want to scan or the object that you want to scan and it brings all the files inside. You can edit it on the screen and go from there. So scanning is, an, scanning is a very important part of the ecosystem for 3D printing. I think that they go hand in hand. Um, there's probably going to be many companies just as the 3D printers are getting very popular that will be bringing these products down to the consumer and prosumer levels. So um, I'm excited to hear what people have as far as questions and things, but that's the scanning side of, of 3D printing and additive manufacturing. And uh, I realize too that uh, the four of us eat, live and breathe this kind of stuff. So it may be a little bit new to, uh, to, to you as well. So just to back up a bit about some of the actual technology and the way this works is someone like Brooks would use his handheld scanner. And in fact, when they came out to the Columbus Idea Foundry a couple of weeks ago, uh, I sat in a, in a swivel office chair and they had a tripod with a scanner pointed at me and they spun me around and infrared light actually scanned my whole head. <laughs> And they took that file and then sent it to uh, Michael, who then took that file and put it through his printer. And the way these work, you have a, a, a filament or a spool of plastic wire, and you have a hot filament, um, filament heater that will melt that plastic wire and, like Ethan described, paint or build up layer by layer these kinds of objects. So that's uh, generally how this, this tech works. Um, but uh, I'd like to know, I know when we were having uh, lunch, a few folks asked, What's the largest thing you can print? Uh, I'd also like to talk about some of the more exotic things like foods. So uh, Ethan, do you want to talk about what the largest thing that, that's been printed yet? Sure. Well, there's, um, as, as we mentioned at the table, uh, there is a device out there that pours concrete and it's on 50 foot rails and you can print a house. <laughs> uh, sort of the next size down. Um, <laughs> is uh, large industrial components. Uh, I think Boeing is working on airplane components that are printed in one piece. Um, who here saw the movie Skyfall, the James Bond movie? The Aston Martin they blew up at the very end of the movie was th a 3D printed one-third model. It was printed in sections, in body panels, and glued together, but it was a one-third size automobile that was 3D printed just so they could blow it up. Um, and uh, uh, I think uh, maybe a month or so back, uh, there was some uh, some news on the web, the International Space Station actually has a machine that prints pizzas. So you can actually print food. Think instead of extruding this hot plastic wire, think you have multiple nozzles, one that extrudes pizza dough, one that extrudes sauce, one that extrudes cheese, and you can make conventional foods. And then I think, uh, you know, Peter at our table said, yeah, and then, and then you eat it. Uh, and that, uh, we, we might still need some volunteers for that. But, uh, but this is, what's that? Hobby area, there's, um, uh, people have previously, because the, if you saw the printer out there has a hot build plate that keeps the plastic from curling while you're, while you're printing it, people have put, have had it extrude raw cookie dough, baked the cookie on the printer, and then used an extruder to frost the cookie with writing on it, all on a 3D printer. And I think that's one of the overarching <coughs> things that tends to get swept under the rug, is that the same skill sets that allow uh, a student to explore um, making a piece of artistic jewelry or allows a chef to explore making products with new mouthfeel or new flavors, structures you can't actually bake or cook, or an engineer to make a new invention, uh, a, a Boeing wing. That skill set is shared across this entire process. So if you learn how to do one of these things, you know how to do the rest. And this is an excellent way, I'll say, to trick kids into learning tech. 
and uh, I, I like to say in the Facebook and Xbox era, an equation and a textbook, which might have been enough for us uh, when we were going to school, uh, maybe not Brooks, uh, <laughs> we uh, uh, now need something more engaging, more visceral, um, more um, uh, interesting. And these things are absolutely interesting. Even if you have no interest, it's, wa it's fun to, to see the thing operate. And this is a brilliant way to inspire folks into doing stuff that might be fun today, but is actually useful, practical, uh, can become a, a business uh, tomorrow. And that's one of the other comments that's been coming out here. We started as a hobby shop, which is a place for people to explore their passions, to make things and, and, and do fun stuff. But it turns out that if you, if you have a good idea and if you can make it, there are people who want to buy it or hire your services to do that. And so at the Idea Foundry, we have about 150 members. About a third of those, about 50 people, are looking to start small businesses or already are operating small businesses, prototyping parts with 3D printing or machining uh, or computer programming, things like that. And a number of these folks are, are up and outing. So we've, had, uh, we've raised over $100,000 using crowdfunding for five different companies. Uh, I know that folks like uh, Michael uh, has a number of different products, and we'll ask him to detail a few of those too. Knockout Concepts, um, uh, and actually Michael started IC3D um, by meeting a gentleman at the Idea Foundry at one of Ethan's 3D printing meetups. So that was uh, a while back. And I know Knockout Concepts <laughs> met their chief tech officer also at one of Ethan's 3D printing meetups. So you have these, these real examples of enthusiasts getting together, embracing this new technology, and then spinning out real companies. And Knockout Concepts is actually moving to, to Franklinton. So we have an example of real um, neighborhood revitalization that's spinning out as little satellite offices from a place that aggregates this kind of talent. So I'll ask Michael to talk a bit more about the, uh, the filament side of the business, too. OK. Uh, I started at IC3D about two years ago. And uh, I'm, as you read, maybe I'm. I'm currently working as a uh, mechanical engineer, product engineer at Honda R&D. I design automotive interiors for future vehicles. And I'm still concurrently doing this at the same time. Uh, it's, it's challenging at times, but it's a lot of fun. Um, I started two years ago to, because one of my passions is uh, just machines, and the other passion is just design and, and creation. So I was, I've been using 3D printers at Honda for about 10 years. And so when the opportunity came uh, about three years ago to get my own kit, uh, I was just fascinated. And so shortly after that, I decided to, um, I looked into the open source community and then I cobbled together just some of the best components and designs and then kind of built our own version. And uh, you know, one thing led to another and, and people asked me to build more and more printers. And, so that's how, how, that's how IC3D really got started. But and then I realized that, okay, maybe this could be a, a business one day. And however, the, as you know, maybe know, the, the uh, desktop 3D printing world right now is extremely competitive. There's uh, several hundred startups out there. Uh, you know, a group of guys, girls come out of college and they can start their own company essentially. So that combined with not being able to find good plastic filament in the market uh, led me to start manufacturing our own plastic filament. Um, the, the filament in the market right now is basically from the plastic welding industry. It's uh, created to repair, to do plastic repair work and things like that. And that's how these nerds in the lab, so to speak, uh, got started using this type of material is because it was very readily available. However, most of the stuff out there there is plastic welding rod. And so I claim to be one of the first companies, 3D printing companies to, 3D printer companies to make our own 3D printing material, right? Because, uh, you know, we understand the requirements and the, the specifications and, and tolerance needs of this material. Um, yeah. Where are you manufacturing that? I'm manufacturing everything in Ohio. We're working with a nonprofit factory uh, in Hillsboro, which is about halfway in between here in uh, Cincinnati. And it's a, it's a skills building factory. And uh, so we've done a lot of training with those folks to assemble printers, 3D printers, test printers, uh, do 3D printing themselves, and also run our plastic extrusion line. Uh, so that's, that's kind of one of the ways we 
kind of help out with the community. And it allows us to keep manufacturing local in Ohio versus outsourcing to China or something like that. Um, so yeah, we see a bright future. It's a, this is a great partnership right now with the community. Um, we're also working with several, uh, we're, we're also working with the local education sector and also nonprofits around town. Uh, for instance, we're working with SeaTech out in Newark and also the Works Museum uh, out there. Uh, we've, we've already supplied them with printers and a lot of filament uh, for, their, for their students. And we're working with uh, the COSI to put some printers there. Um, so a lot of exciting things happening right now. And uh, as someone who's been watching Ethan build this community here in Columbus over the last five years, we've realized the utility in having a product that's specifically designed for this kind of stuff. As Michael mentioned, they've been using off-industry product, and this really uh, is one of the spin-out uh, innovations that helps to spur this, this, this whole process. Um, Ethan, you want to talk a bit more about some of the, uh, the challenges of 3D printing or, uh, or what specifically some of the folks that you've seen come through Columbus and Ohio um, uh, make and do? Um, I'm not quite sure which angle you're... Uh, uh, specifically some of the kind of products or, or innovations that you've seen people making uh, with 3D printers here in Ohio? Well, I mean, uh, obviously, just like Michael, one of the biggest things is um, when you have a 3D printer, you can make more 3D printers, and that's how the, how the movement... <laughs> That's, that's how I got started, was about uh, five years ago. Um, you used to have to... Right, exactly, robots building robots. Is um, you have to put a lot of uh, machine, uh, machining and custom-made parts, but that's exactly what 3D printers are good at making. So as soon as you've got the designs, you can either hand off that part to you know, the guy with the lathe and the guy with the CNC, or you can hand it to a 3D printer, and in literally a couple of dozen hours, eh, you can print all of the pieces you need to make a second printer. And that's, that's how the community has spread as quickly as it has. And that's actually an excellent point. Uh, so a couple weeks ago, like I mentioned, uh, Brooks and uh, his COO, Jacob, there he is, uh, came out to the ID Foundry, scanned my head, we gave that model to, uh, to Michael, and in his basement, uh, he's got a dozen or so of these machines, and he was, he was tweaking the design, so he wound up with how many dozen of these in your basement staring? Many. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> and he sent me a text last night saying, this is getting creepy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My wife was not happy with what I was doing. <laughs> so I'd like to hand you that like business cards. Uh, Jim, <laughs> actually Jim suggested we make our own chessboard for Franklinton where the Columbus Idea Foundry members are one side and the 400 West Rich arts people are the other. So I think, I think that's pretty fun. Um, and uh, Brooks, uh, any other examples of some of the, um, the industry service needs? I remember uh, an exotic use for scanning pothole, for example, for getting the exact yeah, volume the to fill. There's a lot of cool um, examples for scanning. Real quick, I would just tail on the last thing you said. This uh, scanner that I just showed you guys was 3D printed by the technology house in Solon. Um, so you, know, you can get very finished products right off of a 3D printer. Um, so yeah, unique cases for scanning. Um, we have so many people come up to us with ideas, but one of them was um, to have service vehicles drive around town and scan the potholes. And that's pretty awesome, right? <laughs> Get those things filled real quick um, with exactly the amount of asphalt that needs to fit in the hole. Um, other cool uses are really around the house kind of fun little things. You can forever get rid of drawing the line on the uh, side of the door you know, when your kid grows. And you keep, you can just have a little 3D little guy as he grows older, um, he gets a little taller. Um, there, there's a lot of fun things that you can do with this, but I come from a design background, so for me it's, it's more about using it to make things um, that you wouldn't otherwise be able to, or that would be more time consuming. So I think, Michael, you've got a part right there um, from your printer. Yeah. And, and those, those kinds of things are what I think is most exciting about 3D printing right now is it helps you make other objects, build, build bigger things um, with, with small parts. There's a, there's a design of a 3D printer I saw when I was in New York uh, for the New York Maker Fair. You start off with a little one that you can make on a very inexpensive printer, and then it's big enough to make its own larger replacement, and you can go through three and four steps. And by the time they were done, they started being able to build parts this big, and the final printer can make parts this big as each one bootstrapped the next size up. I guess one more tie into uh, real world application with 3D printing and the automotive community, because that's where I'm from, is uh, you know, automotive companies have been using 3D printers. Uh, like, like Alex has said, 
for decades. And the main uh, use was to make prototypes, right? So then you would try out the design and change things up before you cut that very expensive tool to pop out, you know, more parts for pennies. Um, but a lot of low volume companies, uh, as I'm sure many of you probably drive Bentleys and Rolls Royces. Uh, <laughs> so the companies like that are actually 3D printing mass production components and then finishing, the, finishing them off, putting a nice veneer on them, lacquering them, and installing them in car interiors. So that's 3D printed parts from mass production. And that, that um, 3D printing of, of mass um, production, the, the term's now mass customization. So you can actually request what you'd like and have it made at an almost uh, mass production cost. But one thing that, that uh, Brooks mentioned, uh, his background is in design. And again, I'd like to emphasize how art and industry really are united in this kind of field. And in fact, um, his uh, COO, uh, uh, Jake, uh, is a medical doctor that was interested in medical imagery. And so you can really see, and that was the first way that he got involved in 3D scanning. So again, if you're uh, putting together this kind of suite of tools and software and technology and making it accessible at super low cost compared to industry machines and, and free education online, now you have a venue for students to learn fun art, uh, design, creative aspects that then uh, have um, you know, uh, more technological or, or service oriented um, uh, applications. So uh, before I uh, open up to uh, the floor in about five minutes or so, I'd like to ask, um, uh, so Ethan, what, what was the company, uh, what's Hershey doing with oh, 3D yeah. printing? Uh, at the recent CES show, Hershey announced a partnership with 3D Systems, one of the first 3D printing companies going back 30 years, to produce a consumer grade chocolate printer. <laughs> so look, 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 look for that on shelves sometime this year or next year. And uh, what do you do with it? Well, you, you obviously, just, just like we are talking about earlier with the pizza, you print things you can eat, only out of, uh, put, put in cold chocolate, it squirts it out and makes shapes, so you can make your own filled candies, you can make, uh, you know, uh, monogrammed letters in, in chocolate. Um. And why was one of the first three printers called the Cupcake? Yeah, there, uh, there's a the company that's now, it's now uh, rose, risen to fame, uh, MakerBot Industries. They're one of the first mm -hmm. hobbyist 3D printers. Their founder is from Columbus, um, he grew up in Upper Arlington. They, uh, they called it the cupcake because that's about the size of the object they could print. And they said, well, we have a cupcake printer. And one of the first accessories they did was that frosting extruder I mentioned that people have used for cookies. But you can also place a cupcake on the printer and customize the frosting on top. Very fun. So oh, we'd like to start looking at the gastronomy or the science of gastronomy, 3D printing food at, at the Idea Foundry, fun stuff like that. Uh, and again, couldn't be more grateful to uh, have a public access workshop that lets people come in and play with all the tools we have, um, uh, pick the brains of folks who've been doing this as part of their passion or part of their business for, for years. And uh, again, uh, back to the, the partnership with the Franklin Development Association and how we're, we're going forward with all of this. We've been doing this for you know, four or five years at the shop, uh, largely with our, our head down and not making a lot of waves, just uh, working in our own little uh, workshop. Now we're grateful to get a bit more attention. We're grateful to have um, been plugged into this program with the city, given this uh, beautiful uh, 60,000 square foot warehouse uh, to the Franklin Development Association, asking for them to come uh, and, and do what we're doing, but uh, for, for really anyone. And there aren't a lot of places that do this. It's, it's a lot of technically challenging software and tinkering uh, the machines um, we try to make a low cost, but of course there's always an expense there. And then just the, the logistics of managing a community workshop is a bit challenging and uh, couldn't be more grateful to have, uh, to be resonating with the educational, creative, uh, technological, and entrepreneurial communities that see this as a kind of uh, boost to the community. And uh, just to detail exactly what we're doing, and if, uh, if folks had been out to our groundbreaking uh, a week or two back, uh, we uh, kicked off the construction of the first phase of our, our uh, building, building at the first floor, and invited uh, uh, Mayor Coleman down and a number of other folks. And we, uh, we challenged him to, instead of tossing a little bit of dirt uh, with a silver-handled shovel to commemorate the groundbreaking, we challenged him to a power tool drag race, which is an event that we do once a year here in Columbus with COSI, uh, where we take old tools and repurpose them, angle, grinders, circular saws, uh, into fun, sexy little race cars that we raced down a 100-foot track. And uh, when we figured we'd challenge the mayor to it, he was a great sport, and he came up and he said, well, 
I better chest bump you then. And to my great surprise, he came up and hit me pretty hard with his chest <laughs> and completely uh, got into my head and threw me off my game. And uh, uh, I, was, I was very impressed with that. Um, and actually, I'd like to point out, too, that today's, uh, the Metropolitan Club uh, luncheon today, I think the coffee and cookies are being sponsored by Compton Construction. And Compton is our partner. They're doing the construction uh, in our new space. And I think uh, uh, Dennis DeVertoy is out in the back here. And uh, he and, and Blake Compton uh, have really been a, a fantastic partner in, in uh, upcycling and giving us a lot of uh, material that's been uh, removed from demolition sites they're also working on. So there's a real, uh, not just revitalization campaign for the neighborhood, but uh, repurposing of a 100-year-old manufacturing warehouse into a kind of hip new maker space. Uh, and by extension, helping with job force retraining, uh, education, uh, community outreach. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great partnership. And what we're looking to do now, uh, the initial funds that we got to make the project go forth, uh, we're using to build out our first floor. Uh, we're entering a, a, a fundraising campaign in partnership with the FDA to, uh, to raise another million and a quarter to build out the whole, uh, the whole space. And what we're excited about here, too, is that the immediate impact is that we will have a a facility that exactly provides the resources we need, the, the, the industrial space, the ventilation, the, the lighting, and all that. So right away, we can start executing our mission really better than anyone else around the world is doing. Uh, but the long-term goal, since we're buying the building from the Franklin Development Association, we're paying them back over 20 years. So our mortgage payments go to Jim, and he uses that to execute his mission of uh, providing low-income housing, providing economic development, and by having a 20-year lease to own agreement, we're also having a long-term sustainable impact on the neighborhood. And this is a kind of public-private partnership we haven't seen anywhere else. And in fact, we've been invited to, to LA a couple weeks from now to go uh, attend a conference about this kind, of, uh, this kind of partnership. And we think this might be replicable in other places where makerspaces partner with nonprofits uh, and community development corporations to really uh, funnel this kind of energy, technology, uh, science and software into a community public access kind of organization. So uh, couldn't be more, more grateful to be involved in something like that and grateful to our, our panelists here today for bringing their, their time and talent. Uh, I think we're going to open up to the floor right now and would be delighted to hear whatever questions uh, people may have. I'm sure we just uh, struck the tip of the iceberg. Uh, Carol McGuire, this whole topic is utterly fascinating. Um, and, I'm, and I'm so thrilled to hear, Alex, about all of the progress that's been made with Franklin. And what a great initiative and endeavor that's going to be. Um, the, and the possibilities, I think, are so endless with 3D. And you certainly got my attention when you mentioned chocolate. <laughs> I, I <think. laughs> Tell us, if you can, a little bit more about the size and scope of the industry itself. I know you've said it's been around for 30 years, but you know, w what, what's the, you know, like some of the larger companies? Is there consolidation going uh, on at this point? It seems like an awful lot of individuals are building, developing companies, which I'm suspecting may eventually go to, you know, VCs or s other folks to, to do industry consolidation as this moves forward. Maybe uh, uh, Ethan and Michael? Sure. Uh, well, absolutely. <coughs> The um, uh, consolidation has already begun. Uh, I mentioned the MakerBot International, the creator of Cupcake. They were the first hobbyist. They were the first people you go to to buy a kit of everything in the box. Previously, if you wanted to build a 3D printer yourself, you had to go buy these parts from these people and make these yourself and go over here. And, and it was very difficult. And in 2009, MakerBot International said, here's a box. Everything is in the box. Go put this together. And they've sold thousands of those. They've got the biggest desktop uh, presence in, um, in the, the sub $5,000 market. And last year they were bought, th this is a company founded by somebody from Upper Arlington, they were bought for $400 million by Stratasys, one of the other big players along with 3D Systems. So absolutely right, it, you know, it, it is big and it's, it's, uh, it is beginning to coalesce as some of the bigger players are getting picked up. Have a, anything brief to add to that? Or? Um, yeah, so as, as Ethan mentioned, there's, there's a couple really big players out there right now. And then there's a whole bunch of startups happening right now. Um, on crowdfunding sites like Kickstarter and Indiegogo. I mean, I think there's a new printer like every week, just about. So it's, it's been impossible to keep up with that. Um, so, yeah, so 
in IC3D, I'm going to go back to, uh, to IC3D, we, I realized that by doing two full-time jobs and trying to raise a six-month-old girl, uh, that it's, it's extremely difficult to keep up with these companies uh, who are, you know, who these people have, uh, are doing this full-time and everything, to keep up with technology, to keep up with trends and things like that. So one of our strategies is to provide this consumable, and the, the plan is to have all of these companies use this material. Um, but basically, like to, to go back to the question, yeah, it's, that's the scope of these companies right now. It's not very many companies in the middle ground. Um, I think these larger companies are going to continue to gobble up uh, smaller companies and also consumables and things like that to, to have in their arsenal. Thanks for the question. Hi, I'm Marie Trudeau with W.E. Davis Insurance. Uh, thank you for bringing this stuff. It is fascinating. Uh, thank you for giving me something to talk about besides the weather. Um, w when I hear plastic, I think of, of what I've read about this blob the size of Texas floating around the ocean. Uh, does this stuff material ever deteriorate? Is one question. The other is, can you use recyclable materials to make this plastic? Thank you. Yep. Ethan, I might ask you to talk about PLA, sure. and then uh, Michael, I might ask you yeah. briefly about that. Sure. Well, we, um, the, one, of the, one of the plastics that's in use in the hobby 3D printer market is one you can buy at the Micro Center. We've got a couple of pieces outside made of it. It's, it's called PLA. It's the same kind of plastic they use in biodegradable trash bags and biodegradable drink cups. It's made from cornstarch. So there are plastics that do break down, and um, as well as. Yeah, right now there are huge uh, printed parts recycling efforts right now. Um, tr people, very smart people are trying to figure out the methods to collect uh, not just printed parts, but it all, you know, all sorts of plastic um, to then recycle that and, and turn that into either more uh, printing materials or just secondary products such as basketball court tiles or something like that. But um, you can, I, uh, we are actually experimenting with using recycled plastic pellets uh, from reputable, reputable sources to turn that into filament to use, so which can then be recycled again. And last point about PLA, if you have a plastic, plastic that's made from cornstarch, it can burn low and clean. So what you can do is you can 3D print a shape, then put it in a can, fill it with liquid plaster, harden the plaster, put it in a kiln, the plaster gets harder and the positive part burns off because it's made of, of carbon. Then you're left with a negative mold that you can then pour silver or pour brass or bronze or copper or tin into and make a piece of jewelry or a functional engineering component from that. Uh, please. Hi, I'm Peter McCray. I have my own national and now international architectural business. When, when 3D printing first came to our industry, it was to, it was to make models. I mean, that's where we first saw it. And it, it, the medium was like a paper dust, right? And so we would get layer and layer, like a topographic drawing or a topography model that we used to make, you know, a layer at a time. And that turned into the 3D object. But I've seen some things, you know, on television, et cetera, now. And I'm interested in the medium of today. For example, I saw one thing where uh, uh, some sort of DNA material was forming human body parts that are then placed on people and, and they live. Uh, so I don't know what that medium is. And then I've seen other things where like aluminum dust or metal dust or some other things uh, somehow, you know, it's not plastic goo, right? Become 3D elements. Uh, and, uh, and then beyond that, um, uh, what do you guys see as the future of some kind of 3D uh, uh, virtual model that can go into some kind of medium and come out as a 3D object and not have to go through this layering process. Is that possible? Uh, I might ask uh, Ethan to address some of the medium and then uh, Brooks I might ask about some medical imaging for custom implants and such. There are, there are several specific varieties of uh, the technologies used. The earliest is, is the vat of goo you mentioned where an ultraviolet laser takes a liquid goo and hardens it into a, into a polymer. It's, it's a, a little like super glue and, and uh, is a little fragile, a little brittle, but it was the first technique going back to the, the early 80s. <coughs> the, 
what's easier to work with is the solid filament that's in the hobby level because you know you're starting with a solid material you're heating it up just to the point where it starts to flow you squeeze it out and it, it's easy to work with you don't have vats of, um, of of goo to worry about you don't have lasers to worry about um, the the powder version you're talking about there's a couple ones some is it's a plaster dust and you use a liquid binder you can also use inkjet ink in that so that's where you'll see you can get yourself 3D printed as a Star Trek action figure these days. You send a couple of photographs of yourself and you pick a pose from a website and you, you come back six inches tall. And, uh, but that's done with the, the plaster dust, gypsum dust, and, um, and colored inks, and then it's infused with epoxy so it's sturdy enough so it doesn't just crumble in your hands. And then finally, the metal printing is where you take some powder, a plastic powder, sugar, metal powder, either, either using hot air or heat, you can fuse the powders together. The, the technique is all still a case of layering because you've got a very thin work area that you're, um, you're working with at a time. Um, the liquid goo, the earliest ones, they started just sort of having two crossed lasers tracing out the pattern in the vat of goo, but it just wasn't as efficient as slicing and dicing and, and, and doing it that way. It can be done the other way, but it's, it's more fragile, it's a little more difficult to do. So in, in effect, the, the, the layered method is, is the more preferred method at, at this time. And uh, Brooks, you want to talk about some medical imaging? And uh, have you heard about that 3D printed ear? Any idea yes, what that substrate yes. was? Um, I encourage anyone to get onto some TED Talks and look into some of this stuff we're talking about today. There is some great stuff about the medical applications and in particular printing body parts, printing organs. Um, there's a big push for the liver right now because we need more of them than we've got. And so there are machines out there. They're still very experimental, but there's a kid, you know, out in the wild who has a bladder that was 3D printed. It's inside him. He's had it there for 10 years. So this kind of thing is, is pretty exciting. Um, it can be used for uh, mastectomy, for instance, um, for scanning the body's shape and then re being able to reconstruct it. Um, also for custom orthotics, it's pretty exciting that you could go and have your foot scanned or some body parts scanned and have a custom. When you talked about mass customization, it, it brought this to mind. You can have a custom insole or, or other things that are made specifically for your body that fit you um, and, and everybody is unique. So that's the exciting part about the medical applications and 3D scanning is the most direct way to get that in that it captures the exact form of the object that it sees. There's actually a, a spectacular heartwarming story, uh, check it out on the web, about a, a father and son. The son I think was born w uh, with a malformed hand and they bought one of these printers and they designed his new hand with his new fingers and uh, he actually loves that he can um, uh, change his, his orthopedic uh, attachments at, at will. Um, really, really fascinating. Also, one thing that we're actually doing um, is there's a, there's a friend of a friend whose uh, his daughter, they, they live in Michigan, but their daughter, is, I think she's around two, and her hand, her wrist was choked off uh, with the umbilical cord, so she was born without a hand. And they got a, a prosthesis um, donated to them uh, very early on, but, it, but these are extremely expensive because uh, they're, they're one-off, they're custom, and then they're like 10 grand a piece. And so what we're trying to do is, uh, you know, like I said, they're extremely custom, right? So what we're trying to do is to scan her limb um, to see if we can make some, make some adjustments to this piece to adapt it uh, as she grows. So it's another practical application of 3D scanning and 3D printing together. Really remarkable. Uh, Michael, thanks for being patient. Uh, that's great. Um, my name is Michael Bongiorno. I'm an architect. I'm also here representing GCAC today. Um, my question is sort of future forward, and maybe it's building a little bit off of what uh, Peter was asking. Um, in 2005, I read a book by uh, Dr. Neil Gershenfeld with MIT's uh, Center for Bits and Atoms. And in the first half of the book, he talked about more of a low-tech approach to fabrication but in the second half of the book, uh, the inspiring thing was he actually, his premise was currently materials are dumb and technology is smart and the ma machines that manipulate the materials are smart. Uh, he's talking about actually making the materials themselves smart. Things, it, building off of the idea that things build themselves, um, uh, it, it sort of in, infusing these materials with the DNA. So you'd buy raw feedstock and then you'd buy intellectual 
a property for creating a thing, and you would put it in a microwave, and you'd make a thing, right? And then you could, the question of recycling uh, is off the table at that point, because then you could break down the raw feedstock, break it back down to raw feedstock and build it into something else. So my question to you is, how far off do you really think this is? That's a, a very good question, and one near and dear to my heart. Michael mentioned um, juggling two jobs, uh, Honda engineer and also uh, founder and CEO of IC3D. For five years, my background is in material science and engineering, and uh, five years I was working for a Battelle spinoff, doing material design, manufacturing, uh, while running the shop. And that was one of the most fascinating things to me 15 years ago when I first learned about 3D printing is that if you're not making a component out of a monolithic material, all cast metal, all forged metal, but rather you have access to the interior as you're building up, you can put a microchip in that in an engine component that might read a thermocouple that tells you what temperature the engine piston is. And now you can actually uh, sense what's going on inside the black box of an engineering component, feed those wires back to a computer chip on your car that can do much more about fuel efficiency or tell you when something's starting to crack, bridges, things like that. Um, so the, the appeal is enormous. With respect to how quickly uh, that can be implemented, I, I hate to say no, just as a general rule. So I imagine with the, the, the talented folks we have, we could build a 3D printed part. We could stop it part way through. We can embed sensors and microchips in there and then continue printing and do that today, frankly. Uh, but to the point of actually producing smart materials, he was talking about, uh, Dr. Neil, Neil Gershenfeld, materials that assemble themselves, uh, molecules with magnets in them that understand how to structure themselves. I, uh, I'll, I'll let the crew field this question. <laughs> the, um, <clears throat> uh, I've seen some of the demos they make now, and, and these self-assembling materials are blocks that have to have a battery. They have to have magnets or motors. They have to have uh, sensors. and so. The things you're seeing are, you know, blocks on the order of this size. So if you wanted to build something small, like, you know, a wristwatch, we're, we're very, very far away from very, very tiny self-assembling structures. But if you wanted to build something on the order of, like, a Tonka dump truck, we're a little, a little closer to something like that. But even so, the, uh, the scale we're working at, it, it's going to be a very long time. We're going to be not extruding filaments of metal and filaments of plastic to build this. We're going to be building these things atom by atom. And it's quite, quite far off. People are working towards it, but it's 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 decades away. It's like asking for transformers, and we have Legos. <laughs> but, uh, Very good. We'll follow up over a beer. <laughs> uh, yes, my name is John McKnight. I work for Rife's Auto Body in the in the collision repair industry. So I've got a question that Michael might have some insight into. Um, you know, we use hundreds or thousands of of small parts. Uh, you know, plastic clips that perform a lot of different functions. Um, how far away is it before we're going to be able to go on to, you know, the Honda parts website and point and click and order, you know, little pieces like this and, and have them produced, uh, you know, at our facility for us to use? Um, and uh, second question would be our parts that move together. You talked about this a little bit in the last question, but something as simple as like a door hinge multiple components all made of the same material, not just layered together, but they actually have to function within side of each other. Um, is, is that technology you know, currently available? So yeah, thank I you. I think that, that both fascinating questions. I think Michael, if you can give a brief response yeah. now and then maybe we'll follow up after, uh, after lunch at the counter. Okay, yeah, real quick. Actually, somebody texted me yesterday an article that, that Honda released some uh, uh, vehicle data um, that can be 3D printed, for instance. Um, the project is the next NSX um, supercar, so they released the, actually the, the surface data so, so people can 3D print. So we can talk about more of that later. Um, second thing with the hinge thing, yeah, I mean, I, all day long I build components that assemble together and attach together. I mean, these machines, all the joints on the machines out there are, are printed. So I'm not sure if you're talking about printing in one shot and having it function. Yes, you can do that also, and we'll talk more about that, because I know we're off the time. Terrific, really incredible stuff. Um, you know, uh, an, essentially a new meaning to plastic surgery, I think. <laughs> the, uh, um, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I, ho I hope you enjoyed today's forum. Uh, remember, you can see it again at three locations, the Columbus uh, TV3, the Ohio Channel on WOSU, and share it on, we share it on YouTube through CMC's website. 
We, enc we encourage you to continue the conversation in the lobby over coffee and cookies, sponsored today, as Alex indicated, by Compton Construction. Thank you, Compton Construction. We'd also like you to inv invite you back to CMC next week. Uh, please thank our speakers for today, Brooks Myers, Michael Cow, uh, Ethan Dix, and Alex Bandar. Thank you very much.